The word freak is very present in this book in two manners. Tobias refers to himself as a freak, and Beck is called a freak. Now, if one wanted to be clever, one could take Beck's situation here as a metaphor for Tobias's internal struggle throughout this book, an idea that's cemented with this bit. His clawed hands were wrapped around the bars of his cage. He was gazing with pathetic hope at Arya. Through this book, Tobias feels as trapped in his situation as Beck is trapped in this cage, and like Beck, is desperately hoping that Arya will help him escape his entrapment. Arya examines the Horkbegir for a little bit before leaving, but not before chastising Frank for calling Beck a freak. And while you're changing things, maybe you could show a little humanity to these animals. They need bigger cages, more light, more fresh air. At the very least. That's Arya saying that, and I want you to take note of it, because in retrospect, it's one of the most bizarre bits in the book. Well, they know where Beck is now, so the animals st stage a rescue mission. Tobias morphs Horkbegir so that the young and confused Beck would be more comfortable around him, Jake infiltrates inside, then turns off the power, and Rachel morphs an elephant to break down the back wall of Frank's. Hey, Cousin Frank, you got a mighty funny establishment here. Oh, thanks, Dan. Business is really going up since we start spreading the news about our new freak. <laughs> I guess mutant creatures from outer space go together with zoos and mini-golf a lot better than hawks and used cars. Did I tell you about the... No, it couldn't be. It's that fucking elephant again! It's after the whole family! Rachel breaks into the place, but there happens to be a bunch of controllers around and a fight breaks out. Visitor 3 is there. Visitor 3 is always there. Tobias grabs Beck and makes his way out to the swamp in the back, but Visitor 3 is waiting for them. Ah, uh, renegade Horkbegir, he said, sounding delighted. The little runaway in the renegade. Ket Hellpack, if I'm not mistaken. Wait, Ket Hellpack? Didn't I leave you dead at the bottom of a chasm? It's chasm, not chasm, you dolt! Ryan, the hell? For someone with a show on literature, you sure can't pronounce for crap. I mean, chasm, escape, crustaceous? Hey, there's nothing wrong with the way I pronounce words. I think you're just genius because I'm a bigger Utubur than you. Now, please, don't interrupt my videos again unless you have a good raisin. But yeah, is Visitor 3 seriously not at all alarmed that the Horkbegir he personally hunted and believed he killed is standing right there in front of him? Visitor 3 morphs an acid-spitting seahorse monster, and Tobias tries his best to fight it off. But his lack of experience in Horkbegir morph and his clumsy attempts at protecting Beck throw him off, and Beck is recaptured. This just kicks Tobias into another level of depression. With nothing else to do... Tobias and Axe fly out and scout Arya out some more, this time witnessing her jumping into traffic to save a kid from getting run over. This act of selflessness and courage cements Arya as genuine in Tobias's mind, and thinking he might actually have a home to go to, he seriously considers trapping himself in human form and giving up the hawk life altogether. Tobias goes to see Rachel. You can go to this woman as a human. You can be Tobias again. You can have a family. Someone around to take care of you. I don't need anyone to take care of me, I bristled. Rachel jumped up suddenly. Tobias, don't play dumb. You know what I mean. You think I don't know that you've been going hungry? I can look at you and see it. Something is wrong lately. I mean, I saw you... N never mind. My heart was in my throat. What? I almost screamed. You saw what? Eat that... that roadkill? How is it any different from what you do? Or any human? You go to the supermarket and buy beef or pork or chicken that's been dead for weeks. I don't care that you ate roadkill. Stop being an idiot. I care about you. And when I see you doing that, I know things are going wrong for you. But you're off in your own little hawk world, and no one is allowed to help you. You'd rather starve than ask for help. You can't even admit that your life may suck because you'll feel all weak. I'm a hawk, I snapped. A bird of prey. When we're weak, we die. That's the law of us. I'm not a human being. Not anymore. No one helps a hawk. A hawk lives by his eyes and wings and talons. You're a hawk? Rachel sneered. You talk, Tobias. You read. You have emotions. Those are human things, not hawk things. I know! I know! Don't you think I know? That's why I'm going hungry, because I'm not hawk enough. 
That's why I let Beck get away, because I was human enough to care more about my own pain and fear than I cared about doing what I had to do. That's just stupid, Rachel said angrily. It doesn't make any sense. You know what? You have a choice to make, Tobias. You can be a hawk, but you will never, ever, not in a million years, be a true, pure hawk. If you want to stay a hawk, you'll be like you are now. Confused, conflicted, torn up inside, never knowing what you really are. Or, or you can be human again. All human. You can live with that Arya woman and eat at the table and sleep in a bed. And never fly, I said. Never fly again. Never see with Hawk's eyes. Never morph again. I know you guys would be all nice to me, but I'd lose all of you. I'd lose being an anamorph. You wouldn't lose me, Rachel said. I've expressed before that Tobias and Rachel's relationship is a bit more akin to that of a mother and her child than that of boyfriend and girlfriend. Rachel sees Tobias as a boy needing her guidance as much as anything, and she is one to just pour herself into a situation, give it everything she can. The only time she's ever played along with Tobias' hawk fantasies is in, again, Megamorphs 2, when she drew on Tobias' identity as a hawk to make him snap out of the instincts of a deadly dinosaur. By this point, it's come down to, look, you're a big boy now, just make up your own goddamn mind. The next morning, the Animorphs meet up with the hork colony. Everyone believes that Beck will probably be at the Yurk base the free hork have been raiding, probably as bait for a trap. With no option left to them, the hork decide to spring that trap, but instead of just rescuing Beck, they plan to destroy the entire place once and for all. She smiled grimly. The Yurks must not be allowed to think that they can use hostages against us. Aren't you kind of missing the point? Cassie said quietly. I thought the point was to save Beck. No. Toby said. The point is to defeat the Irks. We must be strong. Once we free a hork he must never be taken again. Do you think the Irks will respect you? They won't. They'll come after you harder, Cassie pointed out. Toby nodded. That is true. But the hork will respect themselves. A fool is strong so that others will see. A wise person is strong for himself. The hork will be strong for the hork -Bajir. That way, when the Yurks are all gone, we will be strong. A fool is strong so that others will see. A wise person is strong for himself. That's basically the thesis for this entire book. Tobias has struggled to keep up appearances in front of people like Rachel, to pretend like it wasn't him who ate the roadkill, is proving to be a wasted effort when he can't even fight off a wild hawk from his territory. This book seems to be a cry to get Tobias to shed off his more wishy-washy self-loathing aspects, live with the mistakes he's made, except the killing the Makora thing, of course, no, I'm not going to let it go, and move forward with his life. As the Animorphs and ten of the free hork make their way to the base, Tobias encounters a hork he had attacked during one of their past raids at the whole Yurk Pool. Now free, the hork shares no resentment to Tobias, which gets him thinking. I wondered about the image of hork and humans living side by side if the Yurks were defeated. Humans didn't have a great record for getting along with people different from themselves. Humans killed one another over skin color or eye shape or because they prayed differently to the same god. Hard to imagine humans welcoming seven-foot-tall goblins into a local Boy Scout troop when they couldn't even manage to tolerate some gay kid. Eh, a little preachy, but a YA book just brought up a gay rights issue, so a gold star, I suppose. They reach the base, which it turns out houses a weapon that can destroy ships from orbit. The Animorphs morph tiny bugs and stick to the free hork and the free hork proceed to get captured. Tobias demorphs and proceeds to escape from the cage. I hawked walked out the back of the cage. We hawks aren't fast on our talons, but we do know how to walk. I walked right through the gap of the, between the bars. Orc Bezier controller looked down at me, puzzled, but then looked away. Wait, what? I walked behind the tool shed and I began to morph, the one morph that would seem perfectly at home here. I morphed Ket Hellpack. I swaggered confidently out from behind the tool shed and walked over to the Hork Bezier, who looked like he was in charge. They want to see you, I said. Who? I jerked my head over my shoulder towards the main building. They... It's one of the things you can count on in this world. There's always a they. The hork scowled. 
The yerk in his head was half annoyed, half afraid. The visitor isn't here yet, is he? I turned my head and looked away, like I wasn't allowed to say any more. Now the guy was ten percent annoyed and ninety percent scared. I held out my claw. Give me the key. And it was just that simple. He handed me the key. Ladies and gentlemen, we found them! We found the worst guards in all of Animorphs! Do -do -do -do! The Animorphs make their move, but almost immediately a helicopter shows up, and in the passenger seat is none other than Arya. And by Arya, I mean Visitor 3. Yes, Visitor 3 has been playing the mole this entire time. Why? I haven't the faintest idea. You'd think it'd be a lot more simple to have a human controller play the role. That way, Visitor 3 isn't always having to demorph and remorph every two hours. But kudos for the acting job there, Visitor. The saving the kid was a nice, if completely un Visitor 3 like touch. If I may, I think at this point, K. Applegate was finally attempting to flesh out Visitor 3 as a character. We saw his more humbler than expected origins in the Horpizier Chronicles, and here we see him playing a far more subtle game than we've seen from him before. Also, consider his comments towards Frank earlier, about not calling Beck a freak and making living conditions nicer for the animals. These are not things you'd expect Visitor 3 to say, implying that there are things he's not a total bastard about, that there are areas that he does have genuine compassion in. Tobias thinks otherwise, that Visitor 3 was doing the Sasha Baron Cohen thing of playing the role 24-7, but I'm personally not convinced. Unfortunately, this development seemed to get cut short when the Ghost Riders took over the series. If a Ghost Rider wrote this book, chances are Visitor 3 would be all, Tremble, my minions! Tremble at the sight of my glorious boobies! This puts Tobias in a state of emotional shock and effectively out of the fight, which happens off-screen, the Animorphs successfully blowing up the weapon and saving Beck. Tobias finds himself in a tough spot, but when his birthday rolls around, he decides to go back to DeGroat and see what his father's will has to say, or whatever the hell the Yerks have planned. As he walks to the law office, he realizes the clue that should have given Arya away earlier. I remember seeing her for the first time, watching her through her window at the hotel, me flying hundreds of feet in the air. Then it struck me. The thing that had bothered me then. Supposedly, she had been in Africa bush for years or whatever. But when she left her room, she paused to check her hair. Perfectly appropriate for a normal woman. Just a bit wrong for a woman who'd spent her days hiding in blinds and racing around in open-top land rovers. Yes, because you see, Africa has this common plant that spreads around this pollen that gradually makes you forget that you even have hair. So anyone spending an extended amount of time there would surely not check their hair when going out in the public. Or they would because that's a normal thing to do regardless of how long you've been in Africa. That paragraph was stupid. So anyway, Tobias meets with DeGroat and Arya, and they get on with the will. Anyone who's read the Andalite Chronicles knows what's coming. Yes, the will belongs to Elfangor, who states that the Elmus has allowed him to write this sometime after returning to the Andalite forces. Not a lot is said beyond, I'm your dad, I hope you're doing okay, I hope your mom's doing okay, just be awesome, alright? Thankfully, Tobias is able to poker face his way through the entire thing, calling it crazy when it's over and leaving. Tobias listens in through the door as DeGroat and Visitor 3 discuss whether or not to make Tobias a controller. And Visitor 3 decides not to because he's stupid. Best case scenario, you discover Tobias was hiding something about his connection to Elfangor. Worst case scenario, you got an extra set of hands to help reconstruct the big gun the Endolite bandits just blew up. Anywho. I guess I could be angry at him, but that wasn't how I felt. Elfangor had run away from his duty when he'd come to Earth. He'd had no choice but to return to that duty. No choice at all if he was to play the part he had to play. It'd be the great prince he was. I'd lost a father. Because of that fact, Elfangor had been there when he had to be. When he had to be there. To change the lives of five ordinary kids forever. And maybe, maybe, save the human race. I wonder why the Elmist had allowed my father to leave that letter. But I didn't wonder for long. The answer was too simple. See, I had a duty to do too. And who is there to remind you that what you want for yourself is less important than doing what is necessary and right? Message received, Father. Message received. 
Then Tobias acquires kills and eats the mother rabbit in his field and morphs her to shepherd the bunnies away from the wild hawk so that it'll look elsewhere for food. He did that instead of fight the hawk off because, you see, he morphs a rabbit on the cover. Post book follow up. I have some extensive thoughts on Tobias discovering Elfangor as his father that I'm going to put in a separate video, as it applies to the series as a whole and not just this book. As this book stands, it's pretty damn good, almost in spite of itself. The plot with Beck and Elfangor's will is actually kind of thin, the former not much of an adventure and the latter a pretty pithy thing for the Yerks to focus on. The stakes aren't that high, and the Animorphs' success in both places rely on the Yerks falling into a state of utter idiocy. So I guess it's high praise to Kay Applegate that she managed to make it all as engaging and interesting as it is. The majority of this book consists of internal monologues and introspection, all of which is very well written, if a bit crippled by Megamorphs 2. Yes, I know, but I'd like as much a book about him reflecting on his decisions in that book as I would a book about him being so unstable about his identity. That's why I say it's best to not read Megamorphs 2 or even consider it a part of canon if you have the mind to, as Tobias' actions in reflection to those events make him seem like a petty creep. That said, the changes in Tobias' character is very promising, that of Tobias more sure of himself and less prone to emoisms. However, much like the apparent attempts at developing Visor 3, these developments seem to have been smacked in the kneecap during the Ghost Rider era. There are a few technical errors, such as Cassie morphing the wrong bird of prey, or a normal hork using thought speak at one point, but nothing too bad, and at the end, I find myself liking this book a lot more than I think I should. I give Animorphs number 23, The Pretender, a 7 out of 10. This time